died five days after the other, so my mom ended up traveling to Oklahoma. So she was talking to me on the phone today and telling me um, about this beautiful song that was sang at the cemetery. And she, I mean, she was telling me the words, and I was kind of listening, but when she said the word cemetery, it reminded me that um, I wanted to tell her about the beautiful cemetery that we were at for the graveside um, in Oregon. So the whole time, while she was telling me about this, you know, the, her experience with this funeral, I was thinking of how beautiful that cemetery was. And so later I thought, oh my goodness, I didn't, I didn't give her that full attention, and it was something really important that she wanted. To, for goodness sake, it was probably the song that she wants me to remember to, you know, sing at her funeral. So it was really kind of a sad thing. So memories will affect that, and it happens really fast. It just triggers. Then there's attitudes. Attitudes. Um, if I were to say the word mother-in-law. See, I'm already seeing it. There's, there's this pleasant Don't little look. Don't worry, there's uh, parents and in-laws coming up. <laughs> yeah, we get the parent in-law <laughs> night too. But there's little looks. Um, there's the uh, rolled eye looks or, oh, this, the nice little smile. So it immediately triggers attitudes. So there's different subjects that your spouse might start on, and it just triggers that attitude to come out. So then it... It causes us to not listen properly. Then there's prejudices. Um, often we don't recognize that we have prejudices. And um, it could be a whole range of things that goes through our mind. It could be that maybe we were raised in a different culture, a different part. Um, a lot of times what it is is our respective family's way of doing things is something different than um, you know, our spouses. It could be the way they do holidays. It could be the way they raise their children. Just save some of that for parents and in-laws. Yeah, I, I don't want you to get sidetracked on that. <laughs> so that's an issue. It's an, it, we have in-law issues. So um, that's the, that's an attitude. Then there's prejudice. Oh, we just did prejudices. So they prevent open way. See, you mess me all Sorry. up. Physical environment. This is a big one um, for a lot of people. Different environments make us where we don't listen as well. Maybe the room's too hot or cold. Maybe um, we're in front of a computer screen, we're in front of a TV, the radio's on in the background. Um, for m my particular um, problem would be if Justin were to come in and want to talk to, to me about something important and my, the room that I was in was dirty or cluttered or the kids are in the other room more than likely fighting, um, those little things distract me. And so while he's telling me um, something important to him, I'm looking around the room thinking, oh my gosh, I've got to pick up those things, or why does Jordan always throw his dirty socks in the middle of the kitchen floor? Those kind of things are going through my mind instead of listening to what um, yeah. he has to say. I'll make admission. I mean, mine's surprise football. <laughs> he said TV. It, something like that is huge distraction for me. Right. And you have to walk in front of the TV and turn it off, and then you can talk. All right, so our physical environment can act as a filter to our listening. Time out. Uh, this one can be fixed. You can turn things oh, off like okay. that. A yes. small, another blessing is the DVR pause button. But anyway, go ahead. Oh, please. Um, so you can fix these so easily. Turn things off. Go to the other room. That's what we do. Um, we go somewhere else. The hot tub. To the hot tub. That's mm -hmm. our little... That's our time where there's nothing else distracting me but, you know, the beautiful stars, and it works really well. Um, you know, another thing that works well for us is to actually get in the car and drive because that's just, we're in confined space and there's nothing else. Ten years ago, that was a lot more feasible, but with gas prices, that's right. <laughs> hot right. tub became much more inexpensive. Right. And then the last one is interest. Sad but true. Um, sometimes we're just not as interested in what the other person is having to say to us than maybe they'd like us to be. Um, a woman told us about her visits to see her mother. She wanted to use this opportunity to talk about important issues, the meaning of life and so on. Her mother, however, enjoyed discussing more mundane matters such as price of potatoes, the neighbor's dog barking, or the recent TV show she's been watching. The daughter quickly stopped listening, thinking what sad, boring life her mother led. Then one day she suddenly saw that this was her mother's life. This brought her up short. She recalls, I said to myself, my mother is always interested in everything I do. And I suddenly realized I had not been very generous toward her. So I made a conscious effort to be more interested and to listen. And this has made a huge difference in our relationship. This goes back to um, maybe Justin comes home like on a day 
like he's had today, where he tells me all about, and he has actually already today, I don't know, they turned off 50 some valves and yeah, he dove in the cold water. It wasn't like times. a dive, like superhero <laughs> dive. <It was. laughs> or I may come home and tell him all about this wonderful emotional birth that I just experienced. And, you know, the mom snapped at the husband at this minute and the baby, you know, all of this. And it really takes some effort for each of us to act interested, probably more on his part. Um, so... It, you know what's amazing though when you try to be interested suddenly you are and you learn a lot more about your husband or wife when you really listen to their everyday things that's who they are so all of these filters that Kim's describing these are that white noise that static between the radio transmission and the, and the receiver um, this is that drop call on the cell phone you know the Verizon or can you hear me this is this is that those are these filters are what caused that to happen and uh, if you don't, if you're not aware of what these filters are, it's so difficult to try to recognize when they're when they're taking place, when that's what's going on in your relationship. Um, you to to have effective communication, you have to have great listening. We've already said you have to be able to know what these filters are and get past them. So the second hindrance we're going to talk about is bad habits. Okay, there are five particular ones we're going to point out. There's a lot more. Most of us will fall into at least one of these, probably more than one. Um, so it's really important as we bring these up to try to think of your bad habits because what tends to happen is we immediately say, oh, he does that or oh, she does that one. So try to kind of rein that in and think of what you do, what your bad habits are. The first bad habit would be reassuring. Um, we, maybe we're talking to our husband or wife about something we're finding really difficult, something that's come up that just is hard to talk about. And the reassurer will come in with things like, oh, don't worry, you'll be just fine. Or it could be a lot worse. I know this one person that went through something a lot harder. Um, I'm sure it'll work out. So what happens here is the reassurer, honestly, they just want that conversation to end because they are having a hard time dealing with what's being said as well. They just want the conversation to be over. They want it to go away. Um, this one is my most blatant one. Um, the advice giver. Um, when you start telling an advice giver what you're feeling, you're immediately going to hear something like, well, this is what you should do. Or this is what I would have done. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you what you should do to handle this. Um, Patrick Morley from a book Devotions of Couples wrote that there is no greater loss than the right advice given at the wrong time. Yeah. Um, Gary Chapman from the, the Five Love Languages, which we have that book up here. It's a fantastic book if you haven't read it. The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman. He writes about a man uh, named Patrick. Uh, he was 43 and had been married for 17 years. And he came in to speak with Dr. Chapman. And his first words were, Dr. Chapman, I have been a fool, a real fool. And uh, the doctor asked him, what's led you to this conclusion? He says, I've been married for 17 years. And my wife has left me. And now I realize what a fool I've been. So I repeated, the, or Dr. Chapman repeated the original question. What, what, what do you mean by that? He says, well, my wife would come home from work. And she would tell me all about her problems. And I would listen to her, and, and then I would immediately tell her what I thought she should have done. I always would give her advice. I would tell her to confront the problem. They don't go away. You have to talk with the people involved, or your supervisor, or you've got to deal with your problems. And the next day, she would come home from work, and she'd tell me about the same problems. And I would ask her, well, did you do what I told you to do? And she would shake her head and say no. And so I would repeat my advice again, tell her what to do. And after three or four nights of this, I, I'd get upset. I'd get angry and I would tell her not to expect any sympathy from me. <laughs> if she wasn't going to take my advice, then I wasn't going to bother with it. And then I, this, this man would withdraw and he would go about his normal business. And he said, what a fool I was. What a fool. I realized that she didn't want advice when she told me her struggles at work. All she wanted was some sympathy. She wanted me to listen to give her my attention, to let her know that I understood the pain, the pressure, the struggles that she was going through. But I, um, I was too busy giving advice, and now she's gone. 
Um, author Stephen Covey writes that we have such a tendency to rush in and fix with good advice that we often fail to take time to diagnose and really deeply understand what the problem is in the first place. I read a book recently that um, said, and this is just something maybe to think about and remember, that women sometimes need to repeat themselves several times and don't laugh because it's true, <laughs> um, to discharge the emotional tension that is built up with them. So they may say to you something and you think you've solved that problem and then the next day it's there again. Um, so later on in the night, we'll, we'll yeah. kind of help you how to go about that. But it's just something that women tend to do. They need to release that a couple of times. And as the advice giver, I am guilty of saying, okay, I've heard this. Why aren't you taking care of it? <laughs> All right, then there's the intellectualizing. This is when the listener is trying to find an explanation, always. So you may say to them, you know, I'm really worried about my mother right now. She's so forgetful. Um, seems like every day she's getting worse. What will happen then with the intellectualizer, well, they'll come in and, and tell you what the problem is. Well, obviously your mother has Alzheimer's, or it could be dementia, and then they'll go on to tell you exactly the difference between the two of them and the course to take. So it's really hard because the, they're really not listening to what you're feeling. They're trying to solve the problem. Then there's going off on a tangent. So you're just telling someone something that's happened to you, but before you get to the best part of the story, zoom, they're in there. Oh, that reminds me of what happened to me the other day. And away they go on their own agenda. They're off. They've taken off. You don't have a chance. So you're kind of left in the dust. Um, they've just hijacked the conversation. So then there's interrupting. The interrupter doesn't let you finish what you want to say. If you are talking, I thought you were going to interrupt I was getting ready to. <laughs> you beat me to it. I heard the breath. <gasps> yeah, okay. Sorry. I was just open. I'm like, he is going to interrupt me right now. <laughs> you can't afford to pause to take a breath. If you do, you're in there. Lost your chance. <laughs> Um, one man who went through the course admits that he's an inter interrupter. He says, I thought other people's conversation was something to be endured until I could start talking again. <laughs> All five of these habits deflect the speaker from saying what they're really feeling. What happens then is the speaker wants to shut down. They say to themselves, what's the point? Okay. So these bad habits stop us from communi communicating well. So it's worth us asking then, where do I fit into all of these? So you may identify with one, maybe two, maybe more. Um, if you're finding it difficult to recognize where you're at, we're willing to bet that if we take just one minute here and turn to each other, more than likely your spouse will tell you exactly what your bad habit is. So we're going to do that real fast. Turn to each other. Just one at a time. One bad habit at a time. Yeah. Start with one. Turn to each other and, and see if you know each, the bad habit. So... Hopefully it wasn't too big of a shock. Um, sometimes these habits have got to the stage where we really don't realize we're doing it. When we prepared for this course, we took the eight-week course. And um, so when this question was asked to us, you asked Justin, me. I asked Justin what mine was because I couldn't identify no. it. I had no clue what my and bad habit was. she had no bad habits. He told me that that night and I thought, I'm good. I don't have any <laughs> bad habits at all. So um, God let me know what my bad habit was probably two nights later after that. We were sitting in our hot tub talking. We were talking about something that, I, I don't know, we both get really passionate when we're talking and it's just, there's a lot going on and we're really, just get into it. And as Justin was telling me this, it was something to do with some family I matters. Was diving in to fix a leak or something, maybe? Something like that. Yeah. He, he was telling something that just, man, I, I needed to get in there and say something. And so I remember going, just diving into his conversation. And the first time, I think I kind of noticed his face, kind of, you know, that, that look. And I didn't think anything of it. The second time I did it, he did that look, but then he went, he just kind of paused and looked at me. And then I did it a third time, and finally I go, I'm interrupting you, aren't I? <laughs> yes, you are. Mm -hmm. So I realized that night that I am an interrupter. Mm -hmm. That's my bad habit. And now I see it all the time. I, I see it all the time. 
I have to really work on that. And I, I, you know, I scored great points by saying, "Oh no, sweetheart, you don't have any bad habits." <laughs> but uh, the truth of it was, I didn't know what her bad habits were. I didn't know what mine were because they'd never been. I'd never seen them laid out in front of, my, of us like that. And so once we had that information, then it was able to say, "You know what? I'm I'm doing this to you. I'm I, I'm sorry." And you know, we try to address that. So. And again, we're not scared to tell each other anymore either. <laughs> You're interrupting me, or don't give me that advice. I don't need it. So, so here's the deal. Maybe you haven't. <laughs> maybe you haven't really recognized these before, and this is all new to you. Marriage is a great training ground. You have every day to try to realize those bad habits, and it's not always the big, huge issues that come up that you can practice on. It's the everyday type of life that um, you can practice this listening skill. So. So the rest of this evening, there, there's going to be a couple more exercises that you're going to be able to do. This next one is on page 25 in your manuals. We're going to give you uh, 10, 15 minutes, and along with doing this, um, you can get your dessert. There's either ice cream, two different kinds of ice cream. There's a chocolate and a strawberry cheesecake, I think. And then there's also a, like a chocolate ice cream cake. So feel free to grab some dessert. Before it melts. And um, then just do this a significant memory. It's not going to take you very long, but just you want to spend some time telling each other a significant memory, and then you want to retell it to make sure that you're listening. Right. So Go ahead and get started. We'll interrupt you in a second. Next topic that we're going to move into not is not there. We don't have okay, it. don't have it. We're going to go for the uh, principles for that for effective communication. I know Josh and Tia on the slide mentioned effective communication. Um, we're going to go through five steps on effective communication. Uh, Kim, did you make these? Yeah. By hand. Well, I typed them. Uh huh. And then Each I one individually. To Office Max, and uh -huh. they laminated them for me. Nonetheless, this is cool uh, to have, and this is what we're going to go over right now. Um, each of these, and then be the most difficult part of the evening for Kim and I. Um, we're going to do this. Um, Kim has something that that she's thought of, been working been on, rolling over on my stewing, head, that she wants to talk to me about. And depending on how hard she is on me, I might have something to talk to her about, too. Oh. So, and uh, it's un unrehearsed entirely. So I'm going to really drag out going through the five steps <laughs> so that there's not much time to actually have this conversation. Oh, no, we're going to have it, baby. We're going to have it um, right here now. So the first step in effective listening is to pay attention and do not interrupt. Um, when we're having a, a real, true conversation, I have to stop, make eye contact. Um, you know, it's so easy for those filters to creep in when you're looking left and right. But if you're making eye contact and you're facing the person, or you know, sometimes, honestly, we've learned that women are really comfortable like this, whereas men are much more comfortable like this. So to say you make eye contact might be a glance over the shoulder, you know. But but let them know that you're giving them your attention. Maybe touch, hold hands, um, and not to interrupt what they're saying. Let them take the time. They may even come to a pause, and you just have to be patient with them. Don't fight that urge to try to move on to the next portion. Um, research has shown that an average individual...